In case you're a first time right here, my name's Alex Galliot. I'm the lead pastor here at Overflow. I lead here, a pastor here alongside my wife and alongside a team of people who live to give their time and their energy and their resources to ensure that every opportunity we have to come in here and to worship God and to be with his church is the best that it can be. Would you guys take a moment and give it up for all of our contributors, all of our volunteers, our staff. Thank you guys. Last week we started a new series called Make a Statement. Say that when we say, make, make. A, statement. a statement. And what we've been doing is we've been taking our new mission statement that we're gonna go over here in a moment, and we've been breaking it down word by word, and we've been hopefully communicating a deeper phrase behind why we chose the words that we chose, why we feel like God gave us the words that it has. And last week I preached a sermon entitled, What's in it for me? And the sermon was, of course, inspired by the Bible and by God, but it was also inspired by the first four words of our mission statement, and, that, and it's these words, we live to give. Say that. Say, we live, we live. To, give. to give. And the, the sermon last week was, was about this trap that Christians fall into, and I like to call it the what's in it for me trap, where we come to church for what's in it for us, and we serve God because of what's in it for us. And our walk with God is always and only about what's in it for me. And uh, we come to on Sundays, right, because of what's in it for me. But we talked about how even though that, that is a thing, that's not who we're called to be. We're called to be people who, like Jesus, we not only live to take and to get and to accumulate, but we live to give. We live to serve. We live to give of ourself for other people and for his kingdom. So today, um, we, before we jump into our scripture, we're gonna be in John chapter four if you wanna start turning there. But before we get there, I want us to go back over this new mission statement and I'm gonna show you the parts of the statement that have slightly inspired the, the, the sermon, the message talk today, all right? So this is our mission statement. At Overflow Church, we live to give everyone. Say everyone. We live to give everyone the chance at a fresh start with Jesus and his church, providing people of all ages, all races, and all walks of life an opportunity to pursue their full potential. Now look at someone you're sitting next to and just say, that's good. Now look at the next person beside you, the one that you didn't look at the first time because I guess you don't like him as much. Look at that person and say, everyone. Now say, all races, all ages, all walks of life. Oh, that's beautiful. I love hearing it. Come on, everyone, all ages, all races, and all walks of life. That's where we're pulling from, from our mission statement today. We're going to be in John 4. We're going to start at verse number 5. We have a little bit of reading today. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's a beautiful picture of who Jesus is and what he came to do. Um, so I'm going to read through the whole thing. It's going to take me a second. I'm going to skip through some parts. Um, and hopefully I'll let you know when I'm doing that. But they'll have it up there on the screen for you to follow along with us. So we're going to start off John 4, verse number 5. This is what it says. Eventually, talking about Jesus, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well at noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. Well, he was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food, and the woman was surprised because Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. So she said to Jesus, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift of God, or the gift that God has for you and who you're speaking to, you'd ask me, and I'd give you living water. So we skip, skip down to verse 15, and the woman quickly takes him up on this offer. She says, please, sir. Give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again. I won't have to come out and draw water from this nasty, dirty old well. And he says, go get your husband, Jesus told her. Well, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. If you've had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now, you certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. Then we get to verse 25. It says, the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who's called the Christ, and when he comes, he's gonna explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, 
I am the Messiah. Just then his disciples came back and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? So the woman left her water jar beside the well and she ran back to the village telling everybody, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village, so he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because of what we have heard, or because of how we've heard him ourselves. Now we know that he's indeed the savior of the world. Today, I always say this because I like titles. If I went to college, I would have gone. I know some of you are like, you didn't go to college? No, I didn't. If I'd have gone, I'd have gone for an English degree because I like stuff like that. But if you want a title for our message today, it's this. Everyone, one more time, just say everyone. Everyone, everyone gets a good seat. Everyone gets a good seat. Now, you may not know this about me yet. And I may lose some of your love by saying this, but it's okay. Contrary to some of the opinions that I'm sure you've already made about me, my favorite type of music is rap music. I know some of you are like, what? For real, for real. My favorite music is rap music. From the first time I ever heard the song Gangsta's Paradise by Coolio, <laughs> rap was my favorite, right? I, I am not gangsta in any way. I wish sometimes I was. I wish I could say, you know, I went out on the, the street lights and prayed and the thugs were out. That wasn't my life. It's not. But I love the song. And in fact, um, the very first thing that uh, was ever a common interest between me and my wife was our mutual love for rap music. Um, let me just tell you, gentlemen, if you find a girl that likes the same type of music as you do, put a ring on it, Okay. <laughs> Because this is what's going to happen. You're going to take road trips with that girl. And if you like rap and she likes indie, your road trips are going to suck. <laughs> Find a girl who likes the same. So that's what I did. I said, my, I, she, first conversation. What? She likes rap music? Let's go on a date, baby. Come out with me. <laughs> and hey, it worked out from there. Things, things worked out. But Early, early in high school, especially middle school, freshman and sophomore year, man, my favorite artist were the likes of Lil Wayne and Drake and Eminem and Ludacris and Lil Jon. You name it, man. They were Eminem. You, we, Gucci Mane before he went to jail. They, they were my favorites, okay? But, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, if you turn on Yeah by Usher, Right now, little John Ludacris, I, you wouldn't know who this person was. <laughs> You'd be embarrassed. Like, they had to be like, cut that off the live stream because I would go, no. Some of y'all were at Alicia Conference birthday party this year. You saw that person come out, right? But there's no videos of that floating around, hopefully. But uh, <laughs> as much as I loved rap music, when I got a little bit older um, and was growing in my walk with God and had given my life to Jesus, I still loved rap music. But... I was looking for some rap music that was a little bit less explicit. Now, I'm not going to tell you that you're not a Christian if you listen to, you know, that, that music or those artists. Nothing like that. My wife's a hip-hop teacher. She's got to stay relevant. You're going to see some names like that pop up on my gym playlist every now and then. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is I got to a spot in my life where I didn't want to feed myself that, those lyrics anymore. Um, they were just unhealthy for me spiritually. Um, I, they were causing me to have a, a skewed view of women a skewed um, idea of, of, of sex within a marriage. Um, they were causing me to want to do drugs and to cuss and to drink, stuff that I was trying to grow out of. And so as I got a little older and was progressing in my walk with God, I started searching for some rap music that wasn't as explicit or preferably not explicit at all. And with the help of my dad, who I'm sure he's in here somewhere, I haven't seen him yet. But with the help of my dad, um, and some searching on my own, I came across this guy named Lecrae. Does anybody, we have any Lecrae? Fam <laughs> Family's in the building. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, came across this guy named Lecrae, and all at once, I was immersed into the world of Christian hip-hop 
that I didn't even know existed. But let me remind you, this was in 2009, okay? In 2009, Christian hip-hop and Christian music in general was uh, a little bit behind. Didn't have much to offer. I mean, Christian music itself has always, in my opinion, been just a little bit behind mainstream music. But then when we look at, like, less funded subgenres of Christian music, like Christian hip-hop, it was even further behind. But that was in 2009. Now, fast forward to 2019, 10 years later, Christian hip-hop is bigger and better than it's ever been. I mean, you got so many cool, amazing artists. Of course, Lecrae and 116, they're all still here doing their thing. You got Andy Mineo, Words Played, NF. You got No Big Deal, uh, Deal the Young, DJ Mike LV, What Up RG. I could go on for days. Social Club Misfits just dropped a new album. Listen to it yesterday. It's fantastic. And guess what? The list is growing. It's getting better and better. Some of these guys have even had top hits on like mainstream radio. And that's not to mention people like Kanye West and Chance the Rapper, who they're not Christian hip hop artists, but they're, they're funneling Christian themed music onto the radio stations. And I know some people have a, an opinion about that, but man, my opinion is more Jesus is better every time. It doesn't matter who it is preaching the gospel. I'm fine that it's getting preached, all right? So I love Christian hip hop. And a lot of people, they don't know that I'm going somewhere with this, okay? We're not just talking about Alex right now. A lot of people don't know this, but Christian hip-hop was huge in me giving my life to Jesus. And because of that, I still love going to as many concerts as I can, even still today. But while I love going to as many concerts as I can, there are some concerts that I like and I enjoy and there are some concerts that are my favorite shows ever that I love, that I walk away from not being able to sleep the night before. See, this is what I'm saying. You got some concerts that are the large concerts at huge venues um, where you have all this different kinds of seating. You've got the mosh pit down front, and then you've got the metal chairs behind that. You've got the first row of people, but then you've got the second row of people. And kind of like you get what you pay for. If you pay for a really good seat, you get a really good seat. Um, if you registered early, maybe you get a good seat. If you know somebody, maybe you get a good seat. But if you didn't or you couldn't afford that good seat, then you have to just try to kind of try and enjoy from the distance. And, uh, and I'm not saying those shows are bad by any means. I really appreciate them. And I love when artists get bigger and when their influence grows. And I think that's incredible because they're people. And like, that means God's putting his hand to favor on their life. So I'm not opposed to those big shows, but my favorite events have never been the big shows, never been things like Winter Jam and Outcry Tour and the Rock and Worship Roadshow. I love all that stuff. I think it's fantastic, but it's just not my personal favorite. My personal favorite shows to go to were always the small venues where the artist wasn't as well known yet, uh, where the shows where Everyone got the same experience. It didn't matter whether you were in the back of the room or right up next to the stage. You were pretty much right up next to the stage because it was such a small show. The shows where it didn't matter how much money you had or what time you got there or when you registered, um, that, that none of that mattered because everyone was going to get a good seat at that show because of its size. And if I think back about how much I love those concerts, I think it's the same reason that I love the gospel so much. Because when it comes to Jesus, everybody gets the opportunity at the good seat. Ephesians 2, it says God is so rich in mercy. And he's loved us so much that even when we were dead in sins, because of his grace, even when we were dead in sins, it says when he raised Jesus from the dead, he raised us up from the dead with him. And then we look at verse number six, and it says once he's done that, he then seated us in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That was something that none of us could afford. It was something that none of us could have ever arrived on time to, but because of Jesus and his mercy and his grace, we all get the best seat. And I want to make sure you know that even when it feels like God is far away, and even when you feel like he's nowhere to be seen and you're lost and you're struggling, the truth about your situation 
is that you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Doesn't matter the amount of M's in your bank account. It doesn't matter the mistakes that you've made, how young you are, how old you are, how long you've been in church. Jesus lived to give everyone the same opportunity at a good seat. Jesus lived to give everyone the same chance at a fresh start and a new life in God. Are you guys thankful that you got a good seat, man? Say this to me. Say, I got a good seat. Now, I know this won't come as a surprise to many of us. But the church, historically, has not been very good at putting this concept into application. The concept that everybody gets a good seat. No matter the mistakes that they've made, whether they were public, whether everyone considered them to be the worst mistake ever or not. No matter how young they are, no matter what their race was, no matter whether they're male or female, no matter how much money they gave, that everybody got a good seat. Jesus' own disciples didn't even get it. Look at verse number 27. It says, just then, his disciples came back, and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, talking to her, right? None of them had the nerve. And you want to know why it was that the Bible included that none of them had the nerve to talk to him? Why, why they were questioning it amongst themselves? Because they were questioning it amongst themselves, right? They didn't question Jesus because they were asking each other, why in the world would he be talking to this woman? Oh my, I can't, I can't even believe it. And what you got to know about the disciples is that they were raised in one of the most prideful sexist and racist cultures in the history of the world. To them, this woman in no way deserved a good seat. There was a lot of things happening in this moment that the disciples had a genuine problem with. And they didn't have a problem with Jesus doing this because it was wrong. No, he, he's Jesus. He didn't do anything wrong. The problems that they had were issues that were passed down to them from their grandparents and their parents and their teachers and culture itself. And many of the issues that the disciples dealt with then are somehow the same exact issues that we are still dealing with in church today. But if we, at least us, at Overflow Church, if we want to be people who live to empower everyone, say everyone. everyone. If we want to live to empower everyone of all ages, all races, all walks of life, all backgrounds, all bank accounts, if we want to be those people, then what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to make a statement. And we're going to have to confront some of these same issues. And so that's what we're going to do today. I want us to backtrack through this story. And I'm going to tell you exactly what the issues are that I'm talking about right here. So look at verses number 16 through 17. Jesus, he says to the woman, go get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, oh, you're right. You don't have a husband. You have five husbands, and you're not even married to the man that you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. So we find out quickly that this woman has been divorced multiple times, and, and they weren't out of um, good reason. There was no extenuating circumstance, and we know that because she quickly um, refers to these divorces as sin. So he told me all the sins that I've ever done. She referred to them as that. So right off the bat, we find out that this woman was a mess up. She had made some big public mistakes. Not, not speeding tickets going through Dresden. That's just me. I'm the only one who does that. No, no. She made the big mistakes. The, uh, the mistakes that you don't bounce back from so quickly. The mistakes that get you written about in the newspaper. The mistakes that even church people will feel free to talk about you behind your back for. The mistakes that, you know, when you walk into a church and people are like, why in the world is he here? Those kind of mistakes. The, the, the mistakes that get people really talking about you. Not, not the, you know, not the okay sins. See, we have this notion that there are certain sins that are mm, gross and bad and detestable. And oh my gosh, that's awful. 
But then we have this notion that on the same hand, there are other sins that are more acceptable and more forgivable and easier to live with. And while we know that's not the truth, the disciples, they had this same problem. It's why they looked and they said, why in the world is Jesus talking to her, right? And it's, I think it's so funny, the disciples said that. The same men who Jesus changed so much, they so quickly forgot how poor and despicable they were before they had an encounter with Jesus. The same guys who were tax collectors, meaning traitors, foul-mouthed fishermen, anarchists, thieves. Oh, how can Jesus talk to that woman who's had some relationship problems? How dare him? Right, those same guys. But that's the name of the game when it comes to Jesus. Jesus, the friend of sinners. Jesus, the man who would befriend the people that we deem the worst of the worst. He didn't hang out with the high-ranking churchy people. He didn't hang out with the cool worship leaders, the pastors, the deacons, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests. No, 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 no. Jesus hung out with the demon-possessed and the lame and the sick and the poor, the people that were considered non-people. Jesus hung out with the addicts and the drunks and the cheaters and the liars and the hookers and the divorced. People who, in everyone else's opinion, didn't deserve a good seat. Look at Mark 2 with me really quickly. Mark 2.15. This says later, Levi, and this is Mark actually referring to himself. He, Levi and Mark, the same person. Later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the tax collectors and other sinners, you know, the church people, right? The pastors, the, the contributors, the givers. When they saw him eating with these people, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? And when Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they're sinners. I want you to think about the worst person you know. I'll give you a second. The worst person. That person is the one that Jesus would be hanging out with. And would you like to know our problem? It's the same ones that the disciples and the Pharisees had in this story. Our problem, and I set you up for failure here, I apologize. But our problem is that when I asked you to think about the worst person you knew, you didn't think about yourself. You most likely thought about somebody else because you assume that you're not as bad as them. And we assume that, you know, we've done some bad things, but not like them. We assume that we deserve a good seat. And if not a good seat, at least a better seat than that person. But that's exactly what Jesus came to destroy. Romans 3.23, he says, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glorious standard of God. Let me tell you. Jesus is not like your high school basketball coach, man. He does not play favorites, all right? We are all the worst people. None of us deserve a good seat. We don't even deserve a place in the house. But because of Jesus' love and his mercy and his grace and his willingness to take us in, we all get the good seat. And my question is, how can we, people who have experienced that kind of love, and respect and honor and patience give anything less to anybody else. How can we play favorites? Look at James chapter number two. Start in verse one. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example... Suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry and another comes in who's poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person but you say to the poor one, ah, oh, you can stand over there or sit on the floor. Well, 
Doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Then we get to verse eight. He says, yes, indeed, it is good that you obey the royal laws found in scriptures, love your neighbor as yourself, but if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You're guilty of breaking the law for the person who keeps all of the laws, except one, is just as guilty as the person who's broken all of God's laws. As it pertains to the kingdom of God, there are no favorites because we're all his favorite. He's given us all the best seat. Jesus, he loved us despite our failures and despite our flaws. Jesus is able to see the potential hiding on the inside of all of us. And if we're going to be a church of people who claim to follow Jesus, then I think we got to make sure that we're people who live to give everyone the same seat that Jesus offered them. A seat of mercy, a seat of forgiveness, a seat of acceptance, no matter their flaws. If we're going to be that kind of church, then we got to be a church who lives to give everyone an, uh, an opportunity to encounter God. A church who lives to give everyone the opportunity to pursue their full potential. People of all ages, races, walks of life, all genders, people who've made mistakes, people who think they haven't made mistakes, people who've been coming to church for a long time, people who've never been in church. And why? Because that's who Jesus is. And if we want to be like Jesus, that's what we're going to have to be too. We're going to have to be a church of people who are full of mercy and grace. People who are friends of sinners. Why? Because we're sinners and God was a friend of us. Look at verse number seven. I want to show you Jesus' second risky move here. Verse seven, John 4, 7. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Say woman. woman. Now not only was this woman a mess up, someone who'd made all the bad mistakes and didn't belong with Jesus, didn't belong at my church, right? Not only was she a mess up, she was a woman. Now, we're going to get real here. Is that okay, man? This, this, uh, this series, it's not called Make a Statement because we're not going to talk about nothing. It's not going to make a statement for no reason. It's going to make a statement because we're going to talk about some stuff today. Talk about a marginalized group of people within the context of the church in the last 2,000 years. I find it crazy that the most liberal, unchurched non-believer has the power in them to see and point out how amazing and powerful women really are. And yet those of us that claim to be children of God can't even do the same thing. The church is still struggling with that. But let me tell you, our founding fathers, they had a problem with it too. Notice, they said, why is Jesus talking to a woman? See, it was completely risque for Jesus to be entertaining this conversation with a woman. Jewish men didn't even greet women in public back then. The Jewish culture at that time had a really special way of objectifying and um, looking and noting women as lesser. Women weren't allowed to work, and if they did make some kind of money, it belonged to their husband. It wasn't theirs. Uh, women weren't allowed to get a good education because the Jewish culture at that point believed that all they were good for was conceiving and raising children and tending to the house. They weren't allowed to study scripture. In fact, if they went to the synagogue, they had to be put in a separate room than the men, and they weren't allowed to pray or read out loud. In fact, one Hebrew writer of that time wrote this. He said, for a man to have a daughter is considered a loss. Women never got the best seat. They weren't even second-class citizens. They weren't considered citizens at all. Women were considered property. And yet, we find Jesus, once again, breaking all the rules. We find him not only talking to a woman, but carrying on an entire dialogue with her, something that no one would have ever done at that point. And this trend with empowering women, it followed Jesus throughout his entire ministry. The first person, one of the first people, to ever call Jesus the Messiah when he was a baby happened to be a woman, a prophetess that went by the name Anna. And then as Jesus is in his ministry, we notice a story where he allows a woman who's unclean with the issue of blood to come up 
And even though she's unclean to everybody else, Jesus allows her to grab hold of his tunic and he heals her right there on the spot, no questions asked. We see another story where Jesus allows a well-known prostitute to come in front of him and all of these church people, break her alabaster box of oil over his feet, wipe his feet with her hair and her tears, all the while the church people, of course, having an incredible problem with this woman doing anything like that. Throughout the stories of the scripture, we find this band of women that followed Jesus everywhere he went. And catch this, the Bible says that they ministered to him. They ministered to Jesus. And then at the end of his day, when all the men, all the disciples had fled and it was just Jesus up there on the cross, who does the Bible say was right there with him, even walking with him on his journey to the cross, a large group of women, that same group of women that were with him before. And then you start reading in Acts, and it doesn't say that there were just people gathered in an upper room praying for God in one mind and one accord. And it doesn't just say that the disciples were there. It says that the disciples, along with a large group of women, were gathered together in one mind and one accord. And on that day, the power of God sweeps into their room and the Holy Ghost fills up some people and baptizes them for the first time. And he makes sure that in that moment, he included the fact that there were a large group of women present. Now, I know because I grew up here in the South, I know that some of you have been told that the New Testament is really clear concerning the role of women in the church. I know you've heard 1 Timothy I don't permit a woman to speak to him or to teach a man. A woman should stay quiet and learn in all submissiveness. Now, while those verses absolutely are in there, I would like for you to take into consideration that the same Paul who addressed one group of women in one church, we get over to 1 Corinthians, and that same Paul is addressing another group of women in another church. And he's giving them tips on how to pray and prophesy out loud. I'm telling you, it's not as black and white as you think that it is, okay? The, the gospel is not as clear as some of you have been told that it is concerning this subject. When we read Paul in the book of Romans, he addresses women ministers over and over and over again. He addresses a girl named Phoebe, who is a deacon and a teacher. He addresses a girl or a lady named Priscilla who helped pastor a home church and was an evangelist. And then, to top it off, he addresses a lady named Junia, who he considered to be an apostle, the greatest of the five-fold ministry gifts. Huh, crazy. And then you keep reading in the book of Acts, and we find all of a sudden women prophets coming out of nowhere, ministering out loud, right? And you don't even have to get to the book of Acts to see those. You can see those in the Old Testament. And all this is not to mention the fact that all four gospel accounts record that women were the first to witness the resurrection, and then they were the first to go back and preach the good news to a bunch of men. To put it plainly, women may have actually been the very first preachers ever. Look at Galatians 3. Galatians 3.28, this is what it says. This is the same Paul talking, okay, that we get all of our theology from. He says this, There is no longer Jew or Gentile, Slave or free, male or female, because you're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know if God could be much louder here, okay? Jesus did not come to restrict women. He came to empower women. That's who Jesus was. That's what he stood for. That was the name of the game. Jesus was a gentleman, man. He didn't just give them the best seat. No, no. He walked over to that seat. He pulled it out for him. He let him sit in it, and he pushed it up to the table. Jesus empowered women to be who it was God was asking them to be, man. And you know what we're going to do as a church? The same thing. We're on the same mission. We're not going to hold anybody back from the call of God on their life just because they were a female. It's why uh, one of the first things I ever did here is I quit calling Chelsea our administrative assistant and I gave her the title of our family pastor because that's what she is. She's a pastor. And for anyone who's wondering, there's more of that to come. 
We will have other female pastors at this church. It's why every day I get up here and I say, my name's Alex and I have a pastor here alongside my wife because that's also who she is, a pastor. And I know I've spent a lot of time on this, the, the, the topic of women, but I need to because it's such a touchy and weird topic for us here in the Bible Belt. But our mission, it doesn't stop there. We live to give everyone the chance to, to pursue their full potential in God. You are never too old to grow in your walk with Jesus. You are never too young to be a leader in the kingdom. That's why we got middle schoolers, high schoolers, college kids leading the way here. You're never too dumb. You're never too weird. You're never too strange. You're never too out of shape. Somebody said amen to that. And let me tell you, you can never ever make too many mistakes or be considered too far gone to lose the good seat that Jesus made available for you. If you're with me, say, I'm with you. Look at verse number seven again. Man, we're making a statement. Verse seven says this, John four. It's the third word. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Here we find Jesus' most risky countercultural move of all. This lady wasn't just a lady. And she wasn't just a mess up, she was a Samaritan. And now, for those of you who don't know what a Samaritan is, a Samaritan was somebody who was half Jewish and half non-Jewish. The Samaritans kind of had a shaky past with Israel, and I know that doesn't really mean much to us, but as I, as I mentioned earlier, the Jews were a relatively racist people group. And the group of people that they despised the most, that won out at number one, were the Samaritans. Uh, a theologian, John Lightfoot, he says, for a Jew to have drank or eaten anything that was given to them by a Samaritan was considered as detestable as a Jew eating the flesh of a pig. And you guys know, if you've ever read the Old Testament, that that was the most detestable thing a Jew could do, was eat the flesh of a pig. This shows us how deep the roots of racism ran in this culture. And I know that most of us are not Jews in here and we don't have a problem with Samaritans, but most of us were raised in the South, meaning we were raised in the most racist region of the United States of America, in the history of the United States of America. And whether you know it or not, and whether you'd be willing to actually own up to it or not, that fact has negatively affected us in some way or another. There is no doubt, at some point in your life, you've been taught, because you grew up here, you've been taught that it was okay to assume certain things about certain people because of their skin color. And I don't care if you think that stopped during the civil rights movement. It didn't. Racism is still alive and thriving. All you gotta do is show up at a Sunday service at almost any church here in this city. Or in this region. I know you've heard it before. Sundays are the most segregated days of the week. Now, I know some people are going to say, yeah, but man, it's not, at least it's not as bad as it was before. You know, it was bad back then. But why would we settle with at least it's not as bad as it was before? Can we just be plain and, and clear and outspoken? Racism is in every way completely and totally wrong. But especially within the hearts of the children of God. Look at Matthew 22, 37. This is Jesus talking. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. But a second commandment is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. Racism is incompatible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus made that statement to this woman in that Samaritan town, their entire city experienced a move of God. And I'm here to tell you that if you want to experience a move of God in your family, and in your city, and in this church, 
The first thing that I believe we need to begin doing is checking to make sure that the words out of our mouth and the thoughts in our head and the intents of our heart aren't clouded and filtered through the eyes and through the opinions of racism. God hates racism just like he hates murder and adultery and lying and gossip. And I'm not just talking about the extremist groups like the Aryan Brotherhood and like the KKK. While, yes, I believe that's wrong, I'm talking about the fact that rebel flags still fly high, even though we know all the connotations that come along with that. I'm talking about the jokes that you tell around your table with your buddies at lunch. I'm talking about the parents who still refuse to let their kids date people of a different color. I'm talking about when we assume that a person of color loves rap and plays basketball. That's racism. And while, yes, God loves the racist, just like he loves any other sinner, let's be very loud and clear. Racism is a sin. Now, obviously, racism still exists between the black and white communities in America. That's not a secret, okay? But let's shoot past the obvious. Let's talk about something else because racism isn't privy to only white people or only black people. What about the thoughts that race through your mind when a Middle Eastern person boards your plane? What about the fact that probably none of you have ever invited an Indian person over to your house, right? No, no, I haven't, I haven't either. I'm there. I'm putting myself in that category. What about the thoughts that we have when the Hispanic family moves down the road from us and we just automatically assume that they're illegal, right? What about when we assume that the Oriental person that we go to school with is good at math? It's racism. And we need to make a statement that that's not okay. And that's not who we are. Other churches, they can be as racist as they want, I suppose. But that's not us. When was it that we forgot that song that we learned as kids? You remember that song, Jesus Loves the Little Children? How does it go? All the children of the world, red, yellow, black, white, they're all precious in his sight. See, I don't know how we didn't get it then, but let me make it very clear now. God's children are not just white. God's kingdom is a multi-ethnic kingdom led by his brown-skinned Middle Eastern son named Jesus. And let me tell you, if you don't learn how to love and honor and respect people of all skin colors while you're here on earth, buddy, you are going to hate heaven. You're not going to want to be there. Look at Revelation 7, 9. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and every tribe and every people and every language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. I ain't going to wait to get to heaven to experience that. I'm letting you know right now, Jesus said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I can't speak for anybody else, and I can't speak for any other church, but as it goes with Alex Gallion, and as it goes for Overflow Church in McKenzie, Tennessee, from this point forward, racism is a disease that is completely opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're gonna make a statement, even if we gotta make it in faith, we're gonna be a multi-ethnic church who's led by a brown-skinned Middle Eastern king who goes by the name of Jesus. Would you guys stand up on your feet with me real quick?